In the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus declares to us, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Since the establishment of the Church of Jesus Christ, that light has spread. We are going to look at two periods in Welsh church history where the light has shone brightly, the revivals of 1859 and 1904. Wales in the 6th century, we know some of the names, like David and Padar and Taylor and Ilted, who had this theological school in the Vale of Glamorgan, and sending out men throughout Wales then, planting churches in the 6th century. All these places beginning with Llan. The Llan is, is the piece of ground where the church was planted. These places begin with Llan all over Wales. It was a time of revival changing the face of Wales, literally. One of the Puritan leaders, Walter Craddock, speaks of, of, of the, the gospel running through these mountains like fire in the thatch. And that is back in the 17th century. 18th century then, from the 1730s on, you have wave upon wave upon wave of revival associated with the Methodists, Daniel Rowland, Howell Harris, I don't think people like Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield or John Wesley or Daniel Rowland, they never ever held a revival meeting as such. What they did was preach the gospel and God sent the Holy Spirit in power as they, as they preached. I think there were two revivals in 1859. One was the revival associated mainly with Humphrey Jones, or initiated by Humphrey Jones, from Tredwall in Ceredigion, and carried on then by David Morgan from Aspatiastwith, again in the Ceredigion in the hills behind Aberystwyth. The other was, without any obvious human leadership, and carried on mainly by prayer meetings. Humphrey Jones, he'd applied as a candidate for the Wesleyan ministry. He wasn't accepted, so he went to America. And in America, he began preaching, and he began to hold what he called revival meetings, having uh, experienced some success. Decided he was going to come home to Wales and do something similar here. His stated aim was that he hoped to set Wales on fire. To begin with, at Tredwall, this little village just about nine miles north of Aberystwyth, he held um, prayer meetings for a week with comparatively little preaching. But then he began to preach uh, in earnest with an emphasis on rebuking the church. And one day, uh, who was in the congregation, but David Morgan. David was uh, a minister with the Calvinistic Methodists. And listening to Humphrey Jones, David Morgan was convicted of the poverty of his own ministry and the poverty of his own spiritual life. And a few days later, David Morgan had a, an intense spiritual experience. He could remember everything of a religious nature that he had ever heard in his life. And he was filled with a new spiritual power and zeal. It's been put like this. One night, David Morgan went to bed like a lamb, and the next morning he woke up like a lion. And it was he then, well, Humphrey Jones was still preaching, but he fa fairly soon left the, the public scene, and it was David Morgan who took up the preaching, and first of all, around the Abrasworth area, then into Ceredigion in general, and then throughout most of Wales, not always, but most of Wales, preaching. He would preach a sermon, then he would come down after the sermon to 
what we call in Welsh a set vawr, the big seat, which would be the, the seat where all the deacons sat, then preach another sermon. But it wouldn't be the same kind of sermon. It would be a direct address to those in the congregation impressing on the, the hearers that they must make a decision there and then. People never made a decision for Christ, but this was the kind of expression that was coming in now. And he would normally announce a society meeting. Now, the society meetings had their origin back in the 18th century. The societies, the Syat, was the religious powerhouse, the spiritual powerhouse of the Methodist movement. That was where the, the young converts came together for spiritual nurture and encouragement and for prayer and, and, and so on. If you remained behind for the Syat, that was an indication that you were now regenerate, you were a true believer. The obvious result was, of course, that the membership of the chapels increased dramatically. In 1859, Thomas Charles Edwards was a theological student in Bala, up in North Wales, where the Calvinistic Methodists had their theological college. He was familiar with the apologetics, all the works uh, explaining Christianity. He knew all the arguments and he agreed with them. And yet he had never felt, felt them as a living experience in his own heart. He had never felt their power in his own experience. That was true of many people in Wales at that time. In the summer of 1859, two men came from Ceredigion to Bala to preach. And he says they didn't have much education, but they had more, he says. Eternity came into the service. Heaven came into the place. The chapel was full of eternity, full of God. It was a terrible place. Nobody needed Butler's proofs or Paley's evidences, the, apolo the, the apologetic works. The change that I experienced was sufficient evidence to me of the divinity of Christianity. I had previously been a mass of damnation, and in the service I became a new creature. There were remarkable changes. I like the, the comment, Sabbath is now like a new heaven, and the week is like a new earth. You get a reduction in crime that the mayor of Denby for one quarter between the end of 1859 and beginning of 1860 says uh, they had only one case to try in the local court. And there was this awareness of spiritual realities that God was at work, that God was present. People were flocking to these prayer meetings because of the reality of the presence of God. It was quite common for chapels in a village or a town to come together. They would have their own prayer meeting, but they would also come together for united prayer meetings. 1859 was perhaps the, the high watermark of Christianity in Wales in terms of the, the numbers flocking into the churches and chapels, it made Wales, if you like, the land of the chapel, the landscape. All these chapels dotted here and there, so many of them were either built as a result of the revival or they were enlarged or rebuilt as a result of the revival. Christianity has had such a, such a, far-reaching influence on the whole of Welsh life. That was, that was the case long before 1859, but 1859 confirmed this influence and extended it and created what was, to all intents and purposes, a Christian civilization in Wales. Over a hundred years ago, 
Chapters in Wales at the time would have been pretty dead. Liberal theology was um, gaining foot. There was um, orthodoxy, but rather cold orthodoxy. There was also much um, nominalism in the church. There was a concern because of the lack of spiritual life in the churches. And um, there were uh, groups uh, meeting uh, for prayer. Even in 1902 in the Honda Valley, a group of Baptist ministers were praying uh, specifically uh, for revival. And then during 1903 as well, you had the first Keswick in Wales. And that created an interest in spiritual things. There were individuals who had a very, very deep burden. The burden they had was for souls. People outside the church and people within the churches. Evan Roberts, uh, for instance, he was 26 at the time of the revival, but he had been praying for 13 years. And not just praying, but he wrestled with God. The revival recognised as starting in this building on the 31st of October, 1904. But you can go back to February, 1904, when the Reverend Joseph Jenkins was asking his young people in Tabernacle New Key to give him their uh, proviad, as we say in Welsh, their experiences of God. Young Florrie Evans, in her teens, she got on her feet and she said, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. This is the aspect of those young people in those days. It was profound how God had been working in the lives of young people down in West Wales, where there are no big cities, but more of a rural location. It was the beginning then of a series of meetings uh, in, the, in, the, in the area, and spread then New Quay, Newcastle Emlyn, where Evan Phillips was, uh, Blaenanach, Aberairon, but it was a result. The beginning was there back in February with, with, with Joseph Jenkins. Evan Roberts' desire was to go into the ministry. He wanted to get into theological college. Now, to get into that college, Evan Roberts needed his basic exams. He went down to the grammar school in Newcastle, Emlyn. Now, he went down there in the September 1904. At the same time, Seth Joshua was holding special meetings down in Westville. Seth, he was an itinerant preacher, an evangelist, in a place called Blaen Anarch, in Blaen Anarch Chapel, same denomination as this one, on the 29th of September, and he was praying at the time. And he was praying the prayer, bend us. And that stayed with Evan Roberts, and it was in his mind all the time. And then he prayed it in the next meeting. Bend me, bend me, bend me. Oh, oh, oh. Evan Roberts was humbled, which led to his uh, unusual, exceptional uh, experience of God. That night, I believe, he became usable to God. When he humbled himself and prayed the prayer, bend me, I believe was quite an agonizing prayer that he prayed. Then at the end of October, Evan Phillips in Newcastle Emlyn, he was preaching, now is the hour. And Evan took that message to himself and he believed that now is the time. He obeyed God. He came back, obeyed the Holy Spirit back here on the Monday. That Monday would have been the 31st of October. Evan Roberts came back on that Monday. He asked permission to address the young people in the church which he did in this building after the usual prayer meeting. And he encouraged them to pray the prayer, God, send the Holy Spirit. And he encouraged them to pray that prayer, and the chain prayer. There was a prayer meeting here on the Monday night. On the Tuesday night, a similar prayer meeting down in Pisca, which used to be a daughter church to this church. And on the Wednesday night, it was in Libinus and Gossain. And so those prayer meetings continued throughout the throughout the week in different locations. But it was after that then that the uh, fires of revival broke out in different places, here in Moriah and up in North Wales, all at the same time. 
Evan Roberts wasn't in all those places, but praise God, he was there. It was the work of God. Those prayer meetings would have been packed out. Young people, old people, people coming from work, straight away from work, coal miners coming off the afternoon shift. The meetings went on all hours. One reporter had an interview with Evan Roberts after one of the meetings. That was at 4.30 a.m. That reporter said, nobody was in a rush to get home. What was evident was the presence of God in the meetings. And yes, the, these buildings would have been packed out, but the road outside would have been packed out. And of course, in those days, it wouldn't have been the same as it is today, where we've got our street lights. But in those days, crowds outside, and there, the, this reporter said they had their little lanterns. It was an odd sort of feeling, nobody in a rush, and they'd be singing, and they'd be singing hymns of grace, and they'd be singing because within, deep within their hearts, they knew that Jesus was alive, they knew that God was working. It was a kind of shock in one sense, <laughs> it, was so, it was so unusual and exceptional. You know? As I mentioned earlier, there was such um, so much nominalism, and it did have an impact because immediately, um, going back to the characteristics of revival, immediately there's a sense of God in the area. And also, there were a number of conversions. And when people are converted, you know, then people sit up as it were. Very often the revival were accounts of the uh, drunkards being uh, converted. So that would obviously uh, draw the attention of, of, of people. And that Im happened immediately once the meeting started. And then immediately after that, of course, the, the newspapers uh, heard of it. Um, and then was a, a, the, the, the paper was again a means of spreading uh, the, the news. Because this had not been evident in the churches uh, previously, because these church meetings, that reporter said, there were different things going on at the same time. One person down there could be breaking his heart and a conviction of sin. Somebody over there could be a sh shout of joy, knowing sin's forgiven and peace with God. Somebody else could be singing. Somebody else could be praying. Now that reporter said all this was going on at the same time, but there was no chaos. The young people were used greatly during uh, the, the revival. You know? Because they were young, the enthusiasm, the energy of the, of the young. Also, there were women there, and they had an opportunity to take part in the revival. So you have ladies taking part in meetings also, by, particularly by singing. And uh, one particular lady, Annie Davis, uh, she first met Evan in a chapel called Bethel in Ponta Cymer and she remembers going to the meeting and having trouble getting in and she took two hours to get into the meeting and eventually when she got in she remembers standing on her feet and singing the love song of the revival here is love fast as the ocean a lot of the ladies singing was impromptu and it was unaccompanied as well. In those days, hymn singing and singing uh, was very important to the Welsh people. As today, if you go to a, a big rugby match in Wales, you still have Welsh hymn singing going on because it was something that the Welsh loved doing and uh, obviously it was a great part and God used it uh, to his glory at that time. They were able to sing these hymns and the confession from their hearts came out in the hymns that they sang. In terms of conversion, that the singing very often led people on to the front. And then also you had um, the bilingual aspect uh, where uh, a hymn would be sung in English and also sung in Welsh. And of course, as with the hymns, they would improvise. You know? and some would be singing, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, and um, the others then would be singing, uh, save the drunkard, save the drunkard, save the drunkard now, and others would be singing something else as well, you know, but on the same tune, the same chorus. And the soloists 
but also very important. The most prominent would be Sam Jenkins uh, and his favourite song, um, For Saving a Sinner Like Me. And he had, um, he had the hymn translated uh, by a Welsh congregational minister and uh, insisted that the word sinner should be changed to rebel. My mother's brother, uh, Sam Jenkins, uh, was used during the revival and my uncle lived in Llanelli and on the 12th of November he came up here to Moriah and uh, he knew because they were young men obviously in the same denomination uh, they had met in different meetings and my uncle had a, a fine tenor voice and he was asked to sing Saved by Grace alone and he sang that song here but after that he, uh, he gave his job up he was working in the tin works in Llanelli and he went out with Evan Roberts and with Sidney Evans uh, all over Wales singing the songs of the revival. The revival was first called the revival actually, not by anybody involved in the revival, but by the Western Mail. The newspaper called it a revival and some of the headings was every chapel filled. Atheists converted, drunkards reformed. Newspapers played um, a major part in the revival because it brought to the attention of the people what God was actually doing. Because God impacted on individual lives, family lives and communities. The very fact that people could read this, God was doing this. I mean, there was one um, heading there, um, a judge's tribute. A judge commenting on the drop in the crime rate and attributed it to Evan Roberts and his co revivalists, a chief constable of Glamorgan, in his annual report, commenting on what used to be called Black Glamorgan. The coal miners, these were hard, tough men. In fact, their wives had to meet them on payday at the pit head uh, to have uh, the, the money off them so that they could feed the family for the week before their husbands went to the pubs. Now, pubs in those days were purely uh, drinking dens. God saved the impossible. God saved, and he saved in a tremendous way. When an animal sees the difference in a person's life, Something big must have happened. When these coal miners were converted, they put in a better day's work. But the pit ponies, the little horses worked underground, they refused to work because they couldn't understand the new language. These little ponies were used to being cursed and sworn, but now these men, these hard men, they've been saved. A totally new demeanour, totally new life. You know, some conversion would be quiet, um, uh, wouldn't uh, draw attention in any way, but then suddenly there would be something exceptional happening, um, like the story of Levi Jarvis in Ross near Wrexham. Uh, he was a boxer and um, he drank heavily. You know. Then the revival came and suddenly, without apparent reason, Suddenly, he became a quiet person and fearful. And then eventually went to a, a revival meeting and was converted and con continued faithful to the end of his life. And he was a very well-known character. There were two very important aspects of the revival. The presence of God, the meetings, and this compelling force. There was a young man in the pub laughing and joking with his friends. The young man had been brought up in a Christian home and he went to pick his pint glass and he couldn't grasp that glass. His friends were laughing and joking. He goes again, he can't. Just imagine it when you can't grasp that glass. He ran home. His father wasn't in the home. His father was in the chapel. The young man goes to the chapel. There is father down on his knees. 
praying for his son. God raises leaders to lead and to preach. If you take Evan Roberts and Arby Jones, for example, Evan Roberts was preparing for the ministry and went to Newcastle Emily, and he was never ordained. To have someone like that, for example, um, uh, becoming prominent, that obviously would surprise the, the people in general. He was um, like Howell Harris, he was an exalter and emphasized the love of God. His, Evan Roberts' statements, have most stirring effects upon his listeners. Many who have believed Christianity for years, again returning to the fold of their younger days. One night, so great was the enthusiasm invoked by the young revivalist, that after a sermon lasting two hours, the vast congregation remained praying and singing until half past two in the morning. Shopkeepers are closing earlier in order to get a place in the chapel, and tin and steel workers throng the place in their working clothes. Arby Jones was in his thirties by then, and he'd been to the Baptist College in, in Pontypool. He was well trained and prepared for the ministry, and was ordained to the, to the ministry. And uh, for Arby Jones, it was the holiness of God all the time. And he'd like to turn again and again to Isaiah chapter six. This is Arby Jones going back again to Isaiah chapter six. <laughs> Sin became grievous to those listening to the preacher. But when the message from the altar was proclaimed, suddenly, without one word of explanation, the Spirit so unveiled the truth that the majority of the large congregation of 1,200 people simultaneously sprang to their feet, shouting, Diolchido, praise him. According to the preacher himself, the whole place at that moment was so awful with the glory of God. The messenger left the pulpit and went quietly to the vestry. He, like Evan Roberts in this sense, was quite happy to appeal to the people to come to Christ and you could depend on him that he would preach. Well, with Evan Roberts, you were never quite sure what he would do. He could, he could speak for an hour, more than an hour. He could speak for 10 minutes. And sometimes he didn't speak at all. Yeah. So it's very interesting really, to, to have Evan Roberts and R.B. Jones. One of the characteristics of the revival, I think, that the denominations were able <laughs> to, to work together because denominationalism was quite strong in Wales during that time. But uh, during the revival and, and for a while after that, denominational differences were for, for, forgotten, uh, for, for a while at least. And there are numerous examples you know, all over Wales of, of cooperation. There is no doubt at all, I believe, that it was the work of um, the good hand of God. There was a lasting work. Yeah. It's easy to make sweeping statements about the revival. It was all emotionalism, and at times that was true, but there was a lasting work. The people in Wales were quickened to the need for mission overseas, and that was a direct result of the, of the revival again. Over a hundred years ago, Wales used to send missionaries out to different parts of the world. Today, God, we thank him that he is sending missionaries back to Wales from different parts of the world. This is why it's such a blessing to look back to see what God has done in the past. God saved souls that I'd have said it's impossible to touch. God is the God of the impossible. Same God today, alive today, and looking forward again to him showing his mercy on our land in Wales.